our speaker, CJ Peterson, will do the introduction. Morning, everyone. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, I'm here obviously to introduce our speaker. My name is CJ Peterson. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a uh, communications black for uh, our esteemed uh, statewide elected official, Rob Sands. So first thing I want to do is acknowledge the uh, brochure everyone should have picked up on your way in. Um, on the reverse side, there is a QR code, and uh, Adam will probably mention this, but if you scan that QR code, you can make a tax-deductible contribution to the organization that Adam's about to talk about. So keep that in mind as he's talking, and if you get excited about something, you don't have to clap, just click your phone and, you know, make a contribution. So, um, and uh, I'm not taking a finder's fee for that. So um, Adam Peters um, is, uh, Adam and I have been political frenemies for several uh, we were political frenemies for about half a decade, um, working on opposing campaigns, both, you know, Democrat, Republican, and then within the Democratic Party. And then we had the opportunity finally to work together last year on Admiral Franken's campaign for U.S. Senate and uh, ended up becoming very good friends uh, in that process and um, real friends. So um, Adam and I, uh, the thing that I love about Adam is that he is an unabashed, uh, proud Iowan. And I think that as in a time when so many people are leaving the state and, and thinking that it may not be the best place to live, work, and raise a family, especially as queer people, um, Adam is an unabashed champion of our state. And so I, uh, the, the one quick story I'll tell is that uh, he is a, uh, we were in Washington, D.C. for the signing of the Respect for Marriage Act by President Biden. And uh, we were uh, walking and in, there's a nondescript parking garage that has a mural of Herbert Hoover. And we immediately began shouting to all the tourists around that Herbert Hoover was the best president we've ever had because he's from Iowa. And <laughs> So anyway, so that's just an example of uh, Adam's spirit. Um, Adam is a uh, uh, the operations director at Clock Inc, an LGBTQ plus uh, community center that helps uh, youth and other individuals in the Quad Cities. And he's going to tell you all about that. So please welcome Adam Peters. Good morning. First things first, I want to piggyback off of what Byron said about our gateway staff. A year ago when I was here with Admiral Franken and CJ, um, I had commented at the end of the event uh, about how good the coffee was. And Lynn gave me an entire leftover bag of coffee. And at, at that time, it was like the last few weeks of the campaign, it was so needed. So thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Gateway. I love you forever. Um, and then also, since CJ brought it up, Herbert Hoover was a great humanitarian. I mean, I know the Great Depression was a thing, but he was one of the best presidents after his presidency. So I'm just putting in a good word for Herbert Hoover. Um, but yes, um, as mentioned, I'm Adam Peters, he, him pronouns. I'm the director of operations at Clock Inc. LGBTQ Community Center in the Quad Cities. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the Quad Cities, but there might be some that don't know about it. So we're going to go to our handy dandy Iowa map, which is our hand sideways. Uh, we are the nostril of Iowa, the nostril. Um, the Quad Cities uh, is a metropolitan population of 400,000 people. Davenport and Bettendorf are on the Iowa side, 140,000 people there. Uh, Rock Island is where the center is in Illinois. Um, Moline, East Moline, 100,000 people there and a whole host of towns and cities around filling out the rest of the population. All in all, clock serves two states, seven counties, about 100 cities and towns. Um, we get folks as far as Rockford, Illinois coming to clock, and we get people as far as Iowa City also coming to clock. Um, our center is a youngin. Uh, we're just five years old, but I'm super proud of the community we're building and the resources we're offering the Quad Cities and beyond. Um, they're crucial now more than ever. Uh, we have eight different support groups. We have an LGBTQ uh, middle school group, high school group, college group, an 18 and older potluck group. Um, we have a transgender, non-binary youth group and an adult group, as well as a parents and family members of trans individuals group. 
We also host a LGBT plus narcotics anonymous group. Clock offers free and reduced professional counseling, which is also greatly needed right now. We have a free and gender affirming clothing closet. Um, we take lightly used and new donations. So if ever you're wanting to clean out your closet, you give me a call. I'll make sure to come to Des Moines and get some clothing uh, because it, it is used. Um, and we have a free binder program for chest dysphoria, as well as a free toiletry and self-care product station. We have a wonderful, wonderful small library full of banned books, which I'm sure would make a certain resident of Terrace Hill thrilled. We provide a mentorship program for LGBT plus youth and adults up to 24 years old. That is kind of similar to Big Brothers and Big Sisters. You might be wondering, why does a 24 year old need a mentor? There's a lot of things in life that some of us aren't taught, so it helps. Uh, we offer an LGBT plus awareness training and transgender 101 training to area businesses, organizations, and edu educational institutions. We have a blossoming partnership with a whole host of wonderful community organizations like the Figgy Art Museum, who is in our space every other week, uh, giving art opportunities to our youth. Um, as well as we actually have a clock exhibit right now in the Figgy Art Museum full of all of our clients and support groups art. Um, and it also has a Keith Haring uh, painting on loan. We have a wonderful partnership with Augustana College, which is in Rock Island. Um, we offer a free gender affirming voice class with them and private voice lessons. Uh, the Quad City Symphony, the Raccoon Motel, Ray Gun, just to name a few. We host so many events, so many events, because why be an LGBT plus community center if you're not actively trying to build community? Our center is open on Thanksgiving and open on Christmas Day, or as we like to call it, Clockmas. We'll have turkey on Thanksgiving, and last year we had tacos for Christmas. We haven't quite picked what we're eating this year. Uh, 40 Quad Citizens attended last year's Clockmas. Many told us after that it was their only option that day, and it was their favorite Christmas, Christmas that they could remember. We host a queer prom for high schoolers. Last year was our first, and we saw about 50 Quad, City, Quad Cities LGBT plus youth attend. Um, it was a beautiful night full of joy, and we've already taken um, steps to make next year's even bigger and even more special. We host multiple banned book readings throughout the year. Pride Month is Clock's busiest month. Our dunk tank is an area favorite at the QC Pride Fest with a variety of local celebrities and politicians rounding out dunk duties. Uh, we host open mic nights, trivia nights, bingo nights, and other educational and LGBT plus historical events highlighting our area, our people, and beyond. Um, I was really proud of our National Trans Day visibility this year. We, we hosted a panel of lawmakers from both Iowa and Illinois, including Congressman Eric Sorensen, the first out LGBT plus congressperson to serve for Illinois. Uh, that panel took many questions and explained what they are doing to prote protect LGBT plus Iowans and Illinoisians. I don't know what they're called over there, so... One of our National Coming Out Day featured speakers was actually Nora Reichert, who is the first out transgender journalist in Iowa. She's previously was here in Des Moines uh, before moving to the Quad Cities a few months ago to work at WQAD. One of the attendees of that event sent us an email after. I wanted to reach out to thank you for hosting the National Coming Out Day event. I can't even begin to describe to you how meaningful it was to me. For decades, I lived in the closet and hid a core piece of myself from the people in my life. It was isolating and depressing and hurt me in ways that I didn't even realize at that time. And even once I came out, I didn't feel like a real part of the LGBTQ plus community because I told myself that as a bi woman married to a man, there wasn't a place for me there. 
I came to the National Coming Out Day event intending just to listen, but I got up on stage and told my coming out story and felt the warm embrace of everyone around me, seeing me, welcoming me, and validating me. It felt amazing. I really felt like part of the community that night, probably for the first time ever. It healed something in me. So thank you for making that happen for me and for the rest of our community, especially in a time like this when we desperately need each other. Our stories matter. Our community can be a beacon. I'm sure you're wondering why the name Clock Inc. Uh, our executive director, Chase Norris, is also the founder. He picked Clock saying, based on what we see in society, it is time for change. And clocks are consistent because they always come back around. The hands of time in our logo, along with every single clock inside the center, which don't look at a clock because it, it's only right twice a day. Um, they're all set to 628 for June 28th, 1969, in honor of the historic Stonewall Uprising, which sparked so much momentum and positive change for the LGBT plus Americans. So we have where we started and where we are going all in one word and in one logo. It also is a discreet word to ensure safety of not outing people if they talk in public about coming to the center. And I can attest to the discreetness because you'd actually be surprised at the amount of people coming in to clock to get their watch or clock fixed. It happens way too often which means we have really bad marketing or it's it's doing the job. So um, for the 2023 year, 45% of Clock's clients were Iowans and 55% um, were Illinois residents. Each year, the percentage of Iowans goes up. We don't have demographics for our events, which would undoubtedly be the most attended, but the most attended that is captured are our high school group, followed by the adult transgender non-binary group, and then the clothing closet. I've been with Clock for two years now. Our mission and services are near and dear to my heart because I grew up in the Quad Cities and never had these life-saving services available to me. Uh, the search and longing for community has been at the forefront of my life even before I truly realized it. I was raised in the small town of Walcott, Iowa, which is more famously known for the world's largest truck stop right off of I-80. Walcott is the small town um, of 1,300, a mile south of the truck stop, and just 10 miles outside of Davenport. I had a feeling I was different from an early age. Um, I just didn't know why. I was called a faggot in the second grade and had no clue what it meant. And everyone I asked wouldn't tell me, just telling me that it was very bad. I knew staring longingly in at the underwear packaging in the guys department at JCPenney's wasn't normal. But this was before Google, so I was kind of clueless. I truly didn't realize I was gay until around seventh, eighth grade. Uh, like most youth in the 90s and early aughts, I suppressed it and denied it as much as possible, tearfully praying to God every single night to fix me and continually drinking the Kool-Aid of the conservative United Methodist Church that I so steadfastly attended. I became the best little Bible thumper this side of Mississippi. Grandma called me her little preacher. I made sure everyone knew that my non-tolerance and divine biblical wisdom of the fiery peril of gay people faced was known to all. Yes, just gay people, because I had no concept of transgender or non-binary people then. I was active in all the extremely heterosexual activities like musicals, choir, marching band, student council, geography club, and was also the youth representative on the church admin board. I can vividly remember interviewing candidates to be our next pastor, asking each if they believed it was acceptable to marry gay couples with the full knowledge we were looking for a firm no with maybe some snazzy Leviticus thrown in, and that they would instantly be disqualified if they said yes. 
Luckily, my world was turned upside down my junior year of high school when I befriended a senior who had just become involved in choir for the first time. We both made the Allstate Choir and became even better friends on that trip. I was in show choir as a performer, and he joined the band so he could go on all the trips. To the surprise of 2,400 kids at the largest high school in the state at that time, he came out in a MySpace post, becoming the third openly gay kid at our school. Him being my close friend was now a problem, not just because I was the musically gifted Bible kid, uh, and not because I was closeted myself, but because I knew I had feelings for him. Those days were rough. I couldn't tell this guy I liked him because if I did, it meant I was marching towards the road to hell. Uh, there was no one to turn to, and the thought of self-harm started to flood in and made me think it was my only option. There was no clock available to me, no community groups to let me know it was all going to be okay. It Gets Better was still a few years away. I remember one awful day I sat alone in my parents' bedroom, looking in their mirror, contemplating taking my own life. Uh, luckily, my mom refused to have guns in the house, so that was a plus. And to my extreme thankfulness, God made me a wuss when it comes to knives and blood, and the very thought of it right now can make me pass out, so we'll just stop talking about that. And even more lucky, that boy I secretly liked, he was kind of a badass. He showed me I could be strong and seeing his parents accept him fully and love him unconditionally after he came out was beyond powerful to me, a sort of glimmer that life could go on and be better. You don't need the whole romance novel, but eventually I told that boy I liked him and he became my secret boyfriend for the next year and a half, which of course meant the entire school knew about it. But by that time, I had carved out enough social capital that people didn't say anything about it to me. College was the fresh start where I was able to free myself. I came out to everyone besides my family the day I stepped foot on campus four hours away from home. And through professional counseling services on campus, I was helped to finally come out to my parents on Easter to their great disappointment. I picked it intentionally. If, if Jesus could come back to life that day, so could I. Mom sighed and asked what they had done wrong as parents. Dad didn't say much, but flippantly let me know he always assumed I was gay. My very thoughtful sister gave me a pamphlet on a gay conversion therapy camp I could attend, Exodus. Uh, there literally is a Netflix documentary right now, recently released, with almost all of the leaders of that camp renouncing it, coming out themselves, and now filling the world with positive things for LGBT plus people. I kept that pamphlet with the only intention of hopefully one day rubbing it in her face, how backwards she once was if she ever did see the light. Spoiler alert, she did, they all did. The family life after coming out was frayed for a few years, but luckily I persisted. I dove into college, I dove into music, I dove into politics, I dove into living my authentic life. I, have, I volunteered for the Obama campaign and was a precinct captain at the Iowa caucus where he shocked the nation. I moved to Muscatine, Iowa and co-directed the show choirs at the high school for six years. I continued to follow politics and loved haunting Republicans like Rick Santorum, Mitt Romney, Newt Gingrich, Rick Perry and our very own Joni Ernst with hard hitting questions regarding their awful stances on LGBT plus issues during their stops around Iowa. I supported Bernie Sanders in the 2016 primary and then Hillary Clinton as the nominee. Obviously a second President Clinton never happened. And I felt a huge surge of guilt that day after the 2016 election with the fact that I had never volunteered that cycle to help Hillary win. I didn't help stop the hate. And then hate is basically all we saw for the next four years. I made a vow then that I'd fight my ass off to defeat a second Trump administration. Luckily, I'd get that chance. 
In 2020, I put my life on hold and applied to be an organizer for another funny named candidate trying to win the Iowa caucus. I was among the first hired to help organize and get Iowans to stand with Pete Buttigieg for president. While we didn't win the primary, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. That campaign taught me so much, not just about politics, but how to foster and build community, something I do as my full-time job now at Clock. Pete so wisely stated, the more you know about exclusion, the more you think about belonging. We have a crisis of belonging in this country. And he's right. We do. It's everywhere. Exacerbated by the pandemic, but honestly, it's something that has been growing over the last 20 to 30 years sent into overdrive by a myriad of reasons, social media, corporate greed, systems failing, misinformation, the general failure of institutions that should be helping folks. We see it everywhere and especially in the LGBT plus community. We've come so far yet have so far to go and the attacks on our rights and lives are at an all time high. One day I woke up and the Supreme Court gave me the right to marry anyone that I chose to love. Then a few years later, my area state representative was introducing a ban on gay marriage in Iowa, in the Iowa State House. Oh, how the pendulum swings. Working in a state that is actively trying to protect LGBT plus people is comforting, but living in the state that is actively endangering LGBT plus lives is difficult and often bleak. I've sat down be behind closed doors with uh, legislators. We've shared the powerful stories of our transgender clock youth who need gender affirming care to have the best chance of survival. Seeing these legislators understand it, seeing their sympathy, only to see them march to Des Moines and vote against those youth they privately stated support for. It's maddening. People ask me why I don't just make the five minute move to Illinois. Hate wins that way. Now I fully understand that not everyone has the privilege of casually making a big decision like that staying or going, some families must leave Iowa to protect their transgender youth. I get it. But as long as I'm here, I'll actively make Iowa a place that I am proud to live, a state where our clock clients and LGBT plus community as a whole can feel safe in. It's why an LGBT plus community center in the Quad Cities matters. We show folks consistently and confidently we aren't going anywhere and that they are seen, affirmed, and always welcome. Strangely enough, Davenport was ranked ninth on the list of the queerest cities of America by The Advocate in 2015. That ranking was based on populations of 100,000 or more. And also, to be fair, Davenport was the first Iowa City to ban conversion therapy in 2020 and did not repeal it in fear when Waterloo did just a few months back. But obviously, the state has made giant steps backwards to make the lives of LGBT plus Iowans endangered, and we're seeing those repercussions in the Quad Cities. We hear the gross and disturbing stories from our youth who attend Iowa schools or the adults facing mental and physical harassment at their workplaces. The giant steps back prompted me to change my comments upon receiving the pride proclamation from the city of Davenport earlier this year. What usually is a jovial and thankful message become, became something I'd never dreamed I'd need to say. My statement was as follows. We at Clock Inc. want to sincerely thank the city of Davenport for issuing this pride proclamation. Now more than ever, though, we need allies that are unafraid to stand up for the LGBTQ plus community. Over 400 pieces of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation have moved forward in the state and across the country, many passed right here in Iowa. Misinformation and demonization is fueling a dangerous environment for LGBTQ plus Americans. 
so dangerous that just yesterday, and this was in June, for the first time in their 40 years of existence, the human rights campaign declared a national state of emergency for LGBTQ plus Americans. It's sort of wild to me that I feel that I need to say the following, but here we are. Gay people aren't pedophiles. Drag queens aren't groomers. Trans people aren't mentally ill. Pride is not a month of woke indoctrination. Straight folks don't have a straight pride month because no one is passing laws to ban being cisgender or heterosexual. LGBTQ plus people have been here since the dawn of time, and we will be here far after this current wave of bigoted hate finally dies away. We are your neighbors, fellow Iowans, fellow Americans, simply trying to live our lives authentically and to the best of our ability without the harm from the loud minority. Davenport's official nickname is Iowa's Front Porch. May this proclamation hang proudly on our front porch for all Iowans to see as a beacon of compassion, inclusion, respect, and dignity, and the city's commitment to building an environment and a community in which everyone is valued and everyone has an opportunity to thrive. This front porch is open to all. I'm going to quit preaching to the choir here. Long story short, we need more community centers. We need more Iowans fighting the fight. You're doing it just by being here. I told CJ when we first came here a year ago last month for Admiral Franken's speech uh, to you all, I, I wish the Quad Cities had an FFBC. I'll add that to my to-do list. <laughs> my English grade school teacher would hate me for segueing in this trite way, but in conclusion, I'm asking you all to continue being an active part of your LGBT plus community here. Support your LGBTQ plus organizations and nonprofits. Support your area pride events, not just the big capital city pride, which is truly amazing, but hop in the car and head on, head on over to Ankeny and so support their new fledgling pride. Support your LGBTQ pride center. Support this group. Support your LGBT plus bars. Give with your time, your money, your voice, your physical presence at events, because our stories matter, as Byron was saying earlier. If you're ever in the Quad Cities, please shoot me a message. I'd love for you to stop by and see our vibrant center. Or we have a virtual YouTube tour on our main page of our website, clockinc.org. You can see the space and sign up for our weekly newsletter to keep up to date with all that we do. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I'll take any questions if anyone has any. And if you don't, that's okay too. Yes. Um, become so toxic and I, I love helping campaigns. I will never be a candidate. Um, I'm sure there's two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not happening. Yeah. Speaking of politics, so when legislators that you met with that show their support, when they you know, betrayed all of us, what did you do? I'm just curious how did you call them out on it afterward or just put them off? I mean, unfortunately, phone calls were not taken after the meeting. Emails were not responded to after the meeting. The meeting was set up to have good conversation. And clearly, it was just to make the public feel like they were doing the due diligence. But um, yeah, it was really disappointing. Uh, this certain person that I'm talking about, um, and I have to be careful because we are a nonprofit and I'm, we're not supposed to take sides in some senses. But this person actually had a, a child pass away um, and started a really lovely organization in the Quad Cities, another nonprofit. Um, so I, I felt like we had a really good chance of like connecting and, you know, kind of bridging that gap. And um, when we were there, it seemed like we did. But the modern day. Republican Party is lockstep in Iowa, unfortunately. We have two um, LGBT choruses here in Des Moines. Have you ever had a chorus? Is there a 
So I am a music person. This is right up my alley. Um, so unfortunately, <laughs> um, Eastern Iowa has the choir, which is based in Iowa City. And I actually was a member of that for two semesters. Uh, but when I did move back to the Quad Cities, it was just too much to drive to Iowa City. We have had a few people interested in kind of, they've asked the question, um, I've tried to find people committed to maybe starting something like that, but finding someone that is willing to take that great undertaking has been difficult. So right now um, we have a, a, a lovely church in the Quad Cities in Davenport um, and they hold these like meetups at like a brewery and they have like singing going on and we kind of tell our folks, our singing LGBTQ people, you know, attend this because they're welcoming, they're affirming. And um, that's kind of our only option right now. I would love to see that. So if anyone wants is musically inclined and wants to move to the Quad Cities, let's sing together because that's that's me. Uh, maybe you'll just briefly about the history of your organization. You said you've been there two years <laughs> for me. Yeah. Um, so Chase Norris uh, was in grad school and he, uh, for his, one of his counseling projects um, when he was getting certified, um, he started an LGBTQ youth group in the Quad Cities. And that group started with five kids. And these kids came religiously. They loved it. They had a great time. They were supported. Um, and that was through Western Illinois University. At the end of that semester, when Chase was about to graduate, um, he felt kind of awful about the fact that he was going to be moving on. He didn't know where he would be. So he asked the kids, you know, I want to support you. What can we do to support you after I'm gone? What would you like to see? And pretty much all of them said the same thing. They wished they had a safe place to go. They wished they had a community center. Chase tells a story better than I do, but he said, I didn't know anything about community centers. I didn't know anything about nonprofits. He said he Googled it. He did some research. He thought, huh, maybe I could do this. Then he started talking to a bunch of people. A bunch of people said, you're not going to be able to do this. And that is the way that he's the most stubborn person on the face of the earth. So, I mean, his numbers, it's kind of baffling. In 111 days, he had... Clock Inc. founded and ha then got the nonprofit status within the 150 days, which I think is unheard of. I don't really know about how he did it, but he made it happen. And he had keys to a physical property in the first like three months. Um, so that was the birthplace of Clock. And it was a small, 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 tiny space um, right next to Sherry Bustos' office in Rock Island. And now we uh, have been at this new space for about two years. Um, it is 4,700 square foot. It used to be an old strip mall. So we are in one of the sides of that. And it's just a beautiful, vibrant space. And it grew from five kids to now eight different support groups and all of the different resources that I listed. So, and the dream is to continue. Chase talks about his five-year plan, his 10-year plan. Um, his 10-year plan, he wants to have Clock ha be its own space and offer um, housing to homeless LGBTQ plus youth. I'm curious about uh, your annual budget. Oh, mm. Thank you for asking the question. Um, Unfortunately, we completely run off of fundraising grants and the wonderful donations that we receive from everyone like you. Um, our budget is, I mean, it, it costs clock $12,500 a month to keep it going. So um, that's what we're trying to make every single month. And when I started, it was scary because we would be going... <laughs> Uh, every so often being like, okay, so we have a month left before the doors shut. Um, we are doing so much more uh, fundraising events and getting the word out in the community um, that has helped us. And corporate sponsorship is starting to become a better thing in the Quad Cities. Um, young nonprofits see this problem all the time. 
people don't believe in your mission unless you've been around for 10, 15, 20 years. And it's like, um, sorry, we're actually helping people and we do need your money now. Otherwise this isn't going to continue. Um, luckily we have a lot of great corporate uh, sponsorships that are starting and people who are really seeing the effect of clock in the quad cities. So we're starting to see that money and I'm not losing sleep at, as much at night. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's grants fundraising. We don't receive any money from the state of Iowa, duh. And we don't receive any money from the state of Illinois, but we are trying to work on getting some, um, money from the state of Illinois. Cause I think it's possible Again, I thank you so much. Let's start an FFBC in the Quad Cities. Okay. Wow, Adam, that's amazing. Uh, your your passion is truly inspiring. Um, I, I can see where it's uh, it can be um, contagious in a way, I guess, to, to be around that much energy. You know, I guess I, I try to, but it gets harder as you get older <laughs> to be quite as... <laughs> quite as passionate or, or don't have the energy. Uh, I had no idea uh, the amazing work that your your organization does um, uh, in such a short amount of time. I mean, gosh, you've only been there two years and two years, it sounds like it, it exploded and grew very quickly. Um, the so many events is obviously serving an important need for the LGBTQ community in the Quad Cities. And I, you said you're jealous of FFPC. I'm jealous of what you have there. We don't have that here. I mean, in a way, there's things, but not not to that scale. So, yes, thank you for for everything you're doing. Truly, it's uh, and obviously the everyone here feels that way. <laughs> not everyone gets a standing ovation. So, for those of you on Zoom, he did get one. <laughs> thank you, and have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs>